Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number three, or it's video one of two in the subset on the Bio and Savar law. Specifically, I'm going to derive the magnetic field of a current carrying wire. The previous videos in this section on magnetostatics, this, a video one where I discuss the Lorentz force, a video two where I discuss currents and the continuity equation. More importantly, however, is video number 46 from the subsection on vector calculus for electromagnetism. Here I derive the law of Bio and Savar using some vector calculus and a small bit of magnetostatics. For that reason, the derivation is quite involved and perhaps is above the level of physics or perhaps mathematics that you are at at the moment. If that's the case, there's no need to worry and you can take it that the law of Bio and Savar is an experimental observation and that should do just fine. Just to remind you, we're trying to calculate the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire. Current, of course, is the flow of electrons or electric charge. And all magnetic phenomena come from movement of electric charge. So let's begin. I've written the law of Bio and Savar on the top left of your screen. So of course, the magnetic field is a vector and we have a path integral. So in this case, we're going to have constants mu0 over 4 pi where mu0 is called the permeability of free space. And what we do is we compute the cross product between the current vector and the separation unit vector. And we divide this by the magnitude of the separation vector to be squared. And of course, this is going to be integrated across a line. And we note that the prime coordinates are for sources, or in this case, the position of the electric charges. Now, I'm sure it won't take much to convince you, and perhaps we'll see in a moment, that the current and the dl prime vector will point in the same direction. For this reason, we can take the current out of the integral and instead compute the cross product of the infinitesimal line segment and the separation unit vector. So that's the equation that we have here. Now, it's important to note the following about this particular equation. It falls off at 1 over r squared. We know plenty of other forces that fall off at 1 over r squared, and their theory and so on is very similar. So we know that Coulomb's law and the gravitational law all, revolve, excuse me, all involve a 1 over r squared nature. The unit of the magnetic field is the Tesla, named in honor of Nikola Tesla. The one Tesla, excuse me, is equal to one Newton per meter per amp. So now we are ready to calculate the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire. And I'm trying to illustrate that on the top right of your screen. So what we have is a straight current carrying wire, and that is drawn in orange, and it's the horizontal line here. The current is flowing to the right as you look. I've drawn the infinitesimal line segment, the L prime, in black. Now, of course, I've drawn it much bigger than it needs to be, but that's just for, uh, that's just for ease of uh, viewing, I suppose you could say. Next, the separation vector. So the separation vector goes from the sources, so that's going to be DL prime, or the position of DL prime, back to a detector, or wherever you're going to measure your magnetic field. In this case, I call that position Q, and this, uh, this I, I suppose, is, representa is representing the detector we have at position Q. It's important to note how I define the angles. So when we compute a cross product, the angle between them, in this case, is going to be theta. So that's going to be between the separation vector and the infinitesimal line segment, the L prime. I've noticed, or excuse me, I've called beta as the angle between uh, theta and the, the line itself, or the, the current carrying wire itself. And of course, we have the angle gamma as well. Also, the distance between the current carrying wire and the detector up here is going to be given by small r. You can see you can put any letter you want there. Often people will put in s or perhaps a as well. But I'm going to use it uh, by I'm, I'm going to use the small the letter small r instead. So let's just write down the law of Bio and Savart to begin. We have mu zero i over four pi outside of the path integral of dl prime crossed with the a separation unit vector divided by the magnitude of the separation vector to be squared. Now, let's say, for example, that position Q was in fact d directly opposite the line segment or was perpendicular to the line segment. It's pretty straightforward using the left-hand rule in my case, that's the one I like to use, that if that is the case, the magnetic field would be coming out of the page towards you, the viewer. Now, 
obviously it's going to be at a slightly different angle because of where the detector is so we're going to have some sort of a sine component in our cross product so let's calculate the cross product of dl prime and the separation unit vector it's going to be the product of their magnitudes multiplied by the sine of the angle in between it's the sine of theta of course which is here and it's important to know that that is in fact the angle we use now a small bit of trigonometry will show you that the sine of theta is in actual fact equal to the cosine of gamma and I've written the details of it here but I won't go through those, I think it's pretty straightforward so sine theta is cos gamma so we also note that the magnitude of the separation unit vector of course is going to be equal to 1 so really what we have is that we have dl prime multiplied by the sine of uh, the sine of theta but that should be the sine of theta here like this and that's of course going to be equal to dl prime times the cosine of gamma so you have to excuse that type of there it's dl prime times 1 which is the magnitude of the separation unit vector times the sine of theta and that's the angle in between or we can rearrange that and call it the cosine of gamma so let's move on we now need to calculate what in fact dl prime is that means we need to identify what l prime is so let's imagine that the position of l prime is just the point which i've illustrated right here it's just that point very small bit of trigonometry will allow us to uh, write a the functional form for l so l prime is going to be r times the tan of uh, of gamma then applying the normal rules for uh, calculating the infinitesimal uh, segments or the different the derivatives excuse me we get dl prime is r multiplied by 1 over cosine squared gamma times d gamma just to point out by the way let's say we have a function f is a function or we'll say let's say we have g is a function of x and y if i want to ca calculate dg what i need to do is calculate del g del x dx plus del g del g del y dy and of course you can extend this to as many variables as you require so in this case that l is a is a function of gamma and i just performed this particular uh, derivative here pretty straightforward stuff so calculating dl prime you see that it's all of cos squared gamma times d gamma now going back to the law of bo and savar we need to calculate the magnitude of the separation vector now how do we go about calculating that well notice that this is the separation vector here and once again some pretty basic trigonometry will allow us to calculate the magnitude of the separation vector equal to small r divided by cosine of gamma and we invert that to, and square it and we get cos squared gamma over small r to be squared plugging all of this into the law of bo and savar we get the following functional form notice i've kept the magnitude of dl prime here just for the moment then our, thereafter i swapped in for the magnitude of dl prime which is here and we can see of course that we're going to cancel the cosine squared of gamma and we're left with the following integral on the top right of your screen so mu zero i over four pi times the uh, the the distance from the current carrying wire to your detector and then we have the integral of cosine gamma d gamma so i've plugged in two arbitrary angles uh, gamma one and gamma two so we get sine gamma two minus sine gamma one pretty straightforward and remember of course that this points out of the page and that's due to the left hand rule so this is the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire where we analyze it or detect it at any point away from the the wire itself of course if the wire was infinite in extent gamma one would be, would be minus pi over two and gamma two would be pi over two giving us the magnetic field of an infinite wire mu zero i divided by twice pi r this is an important result and it's one which you should just remember because you'll be seeing it a lot excuse me seeing it a lot the magnitude of the uh, the magnetic field due to an infinite current carrying wire is mu zero i over twice pi r and its direction is out of the the page so let's move on we want to calculate the force 
due to a current carrying wire. Let's say the force due to a current carrying wire I1 on another wire I2. sub I So let's say, for example, we have current flowing through this particular wire here. We know that this wire will have its own magnetic field and it's going to rotate around the, magnetic f uh, around the wire in the following way, just applying the right-hand rule. But it's also going to have, let's call this B B1. This magnetic field is also, of course, going to have an influence on another current carrying wire, provided it is close enough. You know, the, 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 then the 1 over R squared nature won't really matter. So what we'd like to calculate is the force on the second wire due to the magnetic field of the first wire. And it's important to understand which field we're using and uh, on which, uh, which wire we're trying to calculate the force. So the Lorentz force law says that we have the current outside of the integral of dl cross b. Now we're trying to calculate the force on the second wire, so that's going to be f sub 2. That means the current we use is current i sub 2, not i sub 1. The infinitesimal line segment is going to be along the second wire, but the magnetic field is from the first wire, b sub 1. And we know that's mu 0 times the current on the first wire divided by twice pi times the separation between the wires, r. We of course can take out the current I sub 1 because it's going to be parallel and we're going to get, it's, it's going to be of, of no difference and we can take that out and get mu 0 over twice pi times r. I'm going to exchange r for d now because that's, that's more of a convention. d being the separation between the two different wires. So you get the mu 0 over twice pi times d, the product of the currents and then we have the line integral of dl. Now, of course, well, dl can go anywhere. You could integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity, if you like. And then you'll fa have a infinite force on, we'll say, wire number 2 due to wire number 1. However, the force per unit length is finite, and it's mu0 over twice pi times the separation multiplied by the product of their currents. I think it's important to pause here for a moment. So we are looking at the the magnetic field due, due to a current carrying wire. We found that to be this particular equation here. This particular equation analyzed that. Then we looked at the magnetic field due to an infinite wire, so mu zero i over twice pi times r, r being the distance from your wire to your detector. Later I changed r to d, as it would be the more common uh, variable to use. Then we tried to calculate the force due to a current carrying wire uh, I1 on another wire, let's call it I2, and we found that the force was infinite, but that the force per unit length is in fact finite. It's mu0 over twice pi r, or twice pi d, you should have it here, and we multiply that by the product of the charges I1 and I2. Now, the reason the law of Bio and Savar is so difficult to employ is because of the cross products, and cross products are notoriously difficult to, to uh, visualize. So let's just look at the directions for a moment. We know that the magnetic field, or the calculation of the magnetic field, involves the cross product of dl prime and the magnet, excuse me, the separation unit vector. Remember, of course, that dl prime is along the wire, that uh, is, yeah, is is along the wire that you're talking about, but that the separation vector, the separation unit vector in this case, is going from the wire to the detector. All right. So let's see if we can employ the left-hand rule to analyze this. So I personally use the left-hand rule to calculate cross products. Sometimes you can use, or other people use their right hands, and it's a different rule if you use it that, in that way. But I use my left hand. So I've drawn a crude representation of how I use the, uh, my left hand in order to calculate this cross product. So it's going to be dl prime crossed with the, the uh, unit vector, the separation unit vector. So first of all, I would point my, uh, I would close my hand into a fist, my left hand into a fist. I would extend my left finger or my left index finger straight, and I would put that in the direction of dl prime, and that is that is here. Thereafter, I would extend my thumb, so it is it is perpendicular, almost making an L with uh, with dl or with my index finger, and I would then rotate my hand so that my thumb now points in the direction of the second component in our cross product. In this case, it's going to be the separation unit vector. So in this case, it's pointing to the left. So I have an index finger pointing upwards, the separation unit vector 
which is my thumb pointing to the left. And then I extend my middle finger perpendicular to my palm. So in this case, it is, it is here and it's coming out of the page and that indicates the direction of the magnetic field. This means that the direction of the magnetic field due to charges here is, is going directly out of the page. And obviously if, you, if you're trying to de detect it over here. But if you're trying to detect it at different angles, you will see of course that the magnetic field is curling around the wire. And that's given by the right hand rule. Now, uh, we just to say that once more, the magnetic field at wire 2 due to current at wire 1 is out of the page. Alright? So it's out of the page. And just let, I'm going to say that a circle with a dot in the center is, uh, is how we represent that. Now we want to calculate the force at wire 2 due to the magnetic field from wire 1. So go up to the top right of your screen. We know that to calculate the force or the Lorentz force, we need to have the cross product of dl prime cross with b. Now remember which dl prime we're using. dl prime here is on the is on the second wire, but the magnetic field is due to the first wire. So we know that the magnetic field due to the first wire measured at the second wire where it is at the moment is out of the page. And I've illustrated that here. We know that the line segment on the the second wire is going to be up as, a, as I've drawn it there in black and once again we compute the, the left hand rule to get the cross product and we find that the force on the second wire due to the first wire is to the right. In other words, the second wire is being attracted to the first wire. And I've drawn a crude uh, illustration of how I move my fingers or orientate my fingers to calculate this using the left hand rule. This is a very important re result. What we found is if I run current through a, a wire, let's call it wire 1, that means if I have another current carrying wire close to it, the other wire is attracted to it. That's of course where the currents are pointing in the same direction, and we've seen this in the past. So currents pointing in the same direction, they attract. So let's just build on this a small bit and I'll move a bit quicker. Let's say I want to calculate the magnetic field and the, the force on current carrying wire 1 due to current carrying wire 2. So I go to current carrying wire 2. So we know we need to calculate its magnetic field at this position over here. So we need to ca calculate the cross product dl prime and the uh, the separation unit vector. So the index finger points of my left hand points upwards. The separation unit vector points to the right with my thumb. And this means when I extend my middle finger perpendicular to my palm that the magnetic field at wire 1 due to the current at wire 2 is into the page. Whereas in the previous section we found that the, the magnetic field due to wire 1 measured at wire 2 was in fact out of the page. So it's opposite in direction. So we can imagine what's going to happen when we calculate the force. The force is going to be dl cross b. But this time it's going to be dl on the first wire and we know that the magnetic field is into the page. So how do we how do we how do we do this? Well, we point our index finger of our left hand upwards, then we extend our thumb to make an L shape, and we rotate our hand until the thumb points downwards or into the page. Then we extend our left index uh, left middle finger perpendicular to our palm, and if you do this, you'll see that it points towards the second wire over here. So what we found is that the first wire is also attracted to the second wire due to current in the second wire. So both wires are in fact attracted to each other. The bottom line is that currents in the same direction attract, currents in opposite directions repel. And the final thing I have to say is that magnetism is always caused, and I haven't written it here, by moving charges, moving electrons. So I know that was quite long, but I think it's very important to concentrate on the directions. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.